Hey guys, today while we're getting a foot and a half of snow outside, we're going to take a look at this 12 volt, 170 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from Big Battery. Like most of my videos, first we're going to open it up and see what's inside, and then we're going to do some basic capacity and load testing to see if we get numbers consistent with what's advertised. Lithium iron phosphate is a superior chemistry to NMC in terms of safety and lifespan. My long term plan is to move away from NMC, so I thought this would be a great place to start. Now I should point out that this video is not sponsored or anything like that. I purchased this myself and I paid the same price that you guys would pay. If you like what you see and you'd like to purchase one to help support this channel and these types of videos, I will leave a link in the description to where you can order one along with a discount code you can use for 10% off your order. My overall first impression with these is how well built and heavy duty they feel. It's a visually appealing rectangular package weighing in at just around 47 pounds. And just a little bit of info on the specifications of these. They're rated for a max continuous discharge of 175 amps and a 6 second surge of 350 amps. On the side here, this features a 175 amp Anderson connector as the main battery output. On the front, you'll find a lighted on-off power switch, along with a voltage display to show you the current charge of the battery. On the right hand side, there is a 300 amp fuse in there, we'll take a look at that later. This designed to be user serviceable if needed. I definitely love seeing that they moved towards these fuses and moved away from the double pole combined breaker they had been using previously. And I love when a company is willing to listen to customer feedback even if they don't make changes. The fact that they just listened and considered it means a lot to me. Alright, so to get started on looking what's inside, we're going to take a look at the top first. And there are four Phillips screws we need to remove, one in each of the corners. And with those screws out, we can remove the cover. Looking at the goodies inside here, you can see the Anderson connector. And we have the main positive coming off and the main negative coming off down here. The negative is going through this fuse. We'll take a look at the fuse in a little bit. The negative then exits the fuse and goes down to the C- terminal on the BMS. It then exits the BMS and this other white cable going down is going down to the battery pack inside. And this is 4 gauge copper silicone coated wire with a 200 degree Celsius uh, temperature rating which I do like to see that is nice heavy duty wire they used. They didn't skimp on wire size in my opinion. You can take a look at the BMS here. This is Battery Evo brand. And I did note when I looked at this originally that this is a 150 amp BMS for a 175 amp rated battery. I did reach out to Big Battery uh, who confirmed with their engineering team that this BMS is actually rated for 200 amps continuous and that this was a misprint. They are going to correct this on future models, but I do like how they included a basic wiring diagram here as well. So we see here where the five balance pins exit the BMS and they go down to the four cells inside. I also see a power switch over here which is connected to the front power switch. I'm not sure what these additional uh, positive and negative wires are. Guessing that's either power for the BMS or perhaps a temperature sensor. So next I want to take a look at the fuse that's on the right hand side of the battery. And to access this fuse panel you first have to remove the two bolts that hold in the handle. And with the handle all the way we have two more screws that hold on the fuse cover. Alright, so it looks like the side of this case just pops off here. Let's see. Alright, so there's a look at the fuse inside. It is a 300 amp fuse. I believe that is a mega style fuse. I'm not 100% sure on that. I'll have to look that one up later. But either way, if you ever have any problems, you simply remove these two bolts and you can replace your fuse as needed. I also very much appreciate seeing that they used a flat washer on the back. And on the front they have a flat washer and a lock washer. This lock washer will prevent these bolts from becoming loose over time. Alright, so next I want to take off this front cover and see if we can get a look at the cells inside. To do that we have to violate the warranty sticker. So we're going to go ahead and cut that. And then there are a series of Phillips screws on both the right and the left of the container. Alright, so with all those screws out we can remove the front cover here. So there's a nice piece of foam padding inside. And then we also have a hard plastic. I guess that's just a protective cover on the terminal. This is actually quite a thick piece of plastic, so that's nice to see. All right, so inside here, we can see our four cells. These are 170 amp hour aluminum case prismatic cells. And it's actually pretty neat the way they engineered this. So they designed this PCB circuit board to just lay down on top of the cells. That gives them the series connections they need. That gives them the positive and negative outputs, and they even have a little area to connect the balance pins up here. Uh, the board is labeled Battery Evo, which I know is one of their brands as well. And I can see there is a temperature sensor uh, located on the top of the board here. 
So I'm going to go ahead and remove all of these bolts and pull this board out so you can get a look at what cells are actually in there. This is where I put my safety disclaimer. These batteries are capable of a very high discharge rate. You don't want to go sticking around metal objects or anything in here and risk an injury. So please be careful. All right, so I've got all the nuts off and I carefully taped up both of the wires. That way there are no accidents. Simply have to remove this balance pin up at the top here. Let's see, let's get that puppy out of the way. And then I should be able to lift this board right off. So here you can see the four aluminum case cells inside and they do appear to be loose. So let's see if I can lift one out here. Just oh, look at that. All right. So here's a look at the cell itself. Uh, it's just the standard aluminum casing in there and they have it wrapped in a black uh, heat shrink wrap here. I do not see any sort of brand marking anywhere on the cell, but I do see the QR code is intact. So I know it is not a grade B or a low quality rejected cell. Typically on those types of cells, they would scratch this off. So this is a great indicator as well. Aside from that, I don't really know much else about these to be honest. So I'm just going to go ahead and place that back in the enclosure. Making sure that I have the polarity correct here because I don't want to wire those backwards. And before we close it back up, let's do a quick check of the voltages. We're at 3.29 volts, 3.26 volts, 3.28 volts, 3.27 volts. So they are not perfectly balanced, but they are balanced well enough. And I noticed on the bottom of the circuit board is where they have the temperature sensor plugged in, which is kind of neat. So they have a seven pin connector here, which includes both the five balance pins and the two pins of the temperature sensor. So we'll go ahead and return the PCB to the battery. Perfect. And I'll get it wired back up and put back together. All right, so I got all the nuts put back in. I double check them for tightness. Uh, temp sensors put back and the BMS lead is reconnected. So now we put this nice plastic cover back on. Okay. And then we return the top lid. All right, now that it's put back together, one thing I want to test is that it still turns on and it does. Sometimes when you remove the balance lead from the BMS, uh, it won't turn back on once you reconnect it. So you'll actually need to connect together the B minus with the P minus terminal on the BMS temporarily or connect a charger. In this case, when I disconnected the lead, the battery was turned off already. So the BMS did not shut anything down. Now for charging this battery for the capacity test, as I mentioned, it is a standard 170 amp Anderson plug. So you can either make your own cable for it or you can pick up one of these pre-made cables from them. This is a very convenient way to do it. And this is actually the way I did it because I found it's cheaper this way to get the connector and the cable without having to make it yourself. They have a few options on the site. The one I purchased comes with six gauge silicone copper wire with a 200 degree Celsius insulation rating. And it comes with two ring terminals pre-crimped on the end. Now, believe it or not, I do not have a 12 volt charger for lithium iron phosphate yet. So I'm going to run it through my iCharger X6. It might take a little while to charge up with this, but it will get the job done. All right, guys, so this battery finished charging overnight and I have some equipment set up here for capacity testing. So the output comes off of the battery with this Anderson connector. The positive goes directly into this 2000 watt inverter. The negative comes out and it goes through this batrium shunt, which then exits the shunt and goes out to the inverter. Additionally, there is a very thin wire that comes off the side of the shunt and goes to the positive side at the inverter as well. And that is the voltage sense cable. So this shunt is connected to a batrium off camera, which is transmitting data wirelessly to this Android display you see here. So this will keep track of the current voltage, amperage, wattage, as well as the cumulative current and amp hours and the cumulative power in watt hours. So I'll go ahead and turn on the battery. And we're sitting at 13.57 volts. And we're currently pulling 1.43 amps or 19 watts for this inverted to idle. So this is going to be my load for this test. It's just a standard space heater. And this should give us about 800 or so watts. I don't wanna to pull too much through this thin cable here. And I'm gonna turn it on low. All right, so it looks like we're leveling out around 76 amps, 77 amps and 975 watts. So we're gonna leave this run until either this inverter shuts off or the BMS on the battery disconnects. And we'll see how much current has been discharged in amp hours. And this is just under a half C rating on the battery.
We've now dropped below 12 volts and I see it is starting to drop quite quickly. As is normal with lithium iron phosphate batteries since the discharge curve is very flat till the end and then it kind of drops off. So far we've discharged 143 amp hours. I'm still holding in hoping we hit that 170 number but we'll see. And the display on the battery is showing 11.8 volts as opposed to the 11.62 volts noted here. And the reason for that difference is simply because we are pulling 80 amps through a number six wire, which there is going to be some loss of voltage. There's about a foot and a half on each red and black here. Now I didn't bother with the thermal cam for this one, but I can tell the wires are a little bit warm. They're not too hot, but there is no heat whatsoever from feeling the side of this battery enclosure, nothing. So that is uh, pretty cool to see. All right, we're in the home stretch here. We're at 10.09 volts and 156 amp hours. I do believe uh, this inverter will cut off at 10. So we're now below 2.5 volts per cell. I'll have to double check with the specification and see what the cutoff is for this battery. What's interesting is the current has dropped significantly now that I look at this. It seems like this is still running, but I bet this inverter has dropped below 120 volts. This, this inverter is uh, interesting here. There it goes, it finally shut off. It was reading almost 103 volts before it shut off. So the final total is 160.93 amp hours. And that is just nine amp hours short of the 170 rated capacity. But again, there are losses in these cables that this shunt is not taking into account. So I'm very satisfied with this number. All right, so there you go. There is my review and test of this battery. I have pretty much zero complaints about it. I didn't see any loose connections, no poor quality parts, nothing like that. Everything performed exactly as expected. If I really, really had a nitpick, and again, it's not really a big deal, but if I had to nitpick at something, perhaps it would have been nice to use lock washers on the nuts that secured the PCB uh, to the cells inside instead of just flat washers. It doesn't get any easier than this. This is pretty much a straightforward 12 volt lithium iron phosphate drop-in replacement for solar, RV, off-grid, anything like that this battery can be used for. Again, if you're interested in purchasing one, I will leave a link in the description. You can also take 10% off with my discount code, and it comes to $810 with free shipping, and that is right around $372 per kilowatt hour. I know some people often say, oh, well, that's expensive. You can build them yourself. You know, honestly, there are so many people out there that don't want to sit there and assemble cells and connect everything up themselves and do DIY batteries. They want a simple device that you can plug in and just use your 12 volts, and that's what this is. So if you look at comparable pre-built options like this, um, Renogy has one on Amazon currently for $1,350. And you can get almost two of these for that same price and you'd have a 24 volt system. So anyway, if any of you guys have one of these out there or are looking at getting them, please feel free to leave any questions or comments you may have. Uh, this is one of two lithium iron phosphate batteries I'll be taking a look at. Uh, the second one I purchased has been in transit for about two months now and it should be here tomorrow actually. So I'm hoping to have some testing and videos of that one done next week. Until then, thank you very much for watching and don't forget to smash that like button before you go.